Hi again, my beautiful people, my beautiful art lovers. How's everybody doing? Uh, look who that is behind me. Yes, I'm in Porto, Portugal now, uh, and I'm about to go inside this exhibition of uh, Dali's work. And I was talking to someone uh, that works here yesterday morning, and she said that it's an ex ex <laughs> an exhibition of his work that he made when he was like a teenager up into his you know early 20s or something um she said there's some wild stuff in here so i can't wait to see it uh, i'm hoping that i will be able to film in there and talk about it but if not i'll do another um i'll just do another pictorial slideshow and maybe i can do it a little talk at the at the end and you'll see me again at the end of this video. Do you need help? I guess. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Is it okay for me to video inside? Yes, of course. Okay, great. Well, I don't know if you are talking to someone. I'm just recording. Do you oh, want me okay. to stop recording? No, no, of course. Okay. Can, record. can I do a little introduction? Please. Do you, you mind being on YouTube? No, is that no, okay? that's totally fine. Wonderful. Uh, so this uh, exhibition is about Salvador Dali. I don't know if you are familiar. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So this is a little bit of a different exhibition. It's called Dali Universe Exhibition because it's about his whole life. So we focus on his life's work, not just his most famous work, like the melting clocks and all that surrealistic stuff. Okay. So you're gonna start on his journey with him since he discovered art when he was 10 and he started painting. And then you're gonna see all the work he did. He lived in America for eight years. He did a lot of publicity work that you're gonna see here. He also did a short film with Walt Disney. So you're gonna see all of that here. Cool. It's a little bit more intimate. It's a more intimate take on him. But if you are familiar with the artist, I think you're gonna enjoy. Yeah, I'm smiling already. <laughs> it sounds awesome. All, everything that you're gonna see here, it's from private collectors. So it's not things that were shown before. I will just ask you to be oh. careful with the barriers so you don't fall and please film and take pictures all you want as long as you don't use flash, please. Yes, yes. This is an engraving. This is 1930. This is 1930, so he's like 28 years old, and wow, look at this. This is, uh, look at this figure. This is something that showed up in one of his later paintings. We can see the cray cray coming out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, yeah, he was crazy, but um, we know that his, his work was, you know, the surrealist movement, and that's, whoa, okay, we've got some... Uh, our friend Dali uh, liked to get a little risque, looks like. He had sex on his mind. He was 36. Let me do these. Uh, yep. Yeah, he was definitely a dirty bird. This uh, drawing was for a book by Andre Breton who we know was one of the uh, other surrealists, um, surrealist poets that began, that Dali hung out with, and that's how the whole movement got started. Hmm.
So I'm thinking about that, uh, some of these, um, some of the more risque drawings that we just saw. And um, I saw uh, another Dali exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum of Art years ago. And <clears throat> I left there being feeling very angry because uh, I believe, I think I took my dog. I, no, I think I was alone. My daughter did not go with me. Um, but there were 200 pieces in the exhibit and, you know, lots and lots of paintings, lots of drawings, etc. And uh, one drawing was very pornographic and it was, um, <laughs> to me, it, it smacked of pedophilia. And it was a drawing of a man um, performing with a child performing on him. And he called it Sweet Treats for Children. Yeah, so if we don't think that Dolly was a creep and a pervert, um, you would be wrong because he was. And, you know, I had this discussion with my daughter and son-in-law. Uh, my my son-in-law was reading a book about Dolly and about his marketing and his outrageousness and, you know, how he would um, just do things to provoke people. Um, and, and, may, and, 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 you know, my son-in-law, Ben, made the suggestion that um, perhaps the drawing was just, just made for that purpose. Um, and I said, oh, okay, yeah, well, maybe, you know, but, oops, sorry about that. Um, uh, seeing some of these drawings, I'm um, kind of wondering, but, uh, yeah, he was, he was definitely a creep. Talented creep. And I'm just going to go along here just so you can get an idea of what's in this exhibition. I'm going to show it to you and then I'm going to go back and spend more time with it myself. Dali News, <laughs> Monarch of the Dailies. Look at this, triumphs and up, oh, humorous. Well, how about that? <laughs> Printed paper. Some of his magazine work. Wow. Oh. There's quite a lot here. This is definitely things that you don't see in major exhibitions. He was an extremely prolific artist, obviously. Um, when I was at that show at the Philadelphia Art Museum, the the number of paintings that he produced and the size of them and the sheer just they were so incredibly beautiful just to see them in person was incredibly amazing and um you know there's no denying the man's genius and talent that's for sure wow this is a big show this is a big big show <laughs> okay wow there's so much here. Okay, I am going to go off here for just a bit, and I'm going to go back so I can look and enjoy, and then we'll pick it up here when I'm ready. Okay, see you in a bit. Okay, so now we are going into the Atkinson Chapel, um, and there's a wonderful young man in here who's going to tell us all about it, if I can find him now. There you are. Do you want to tell me about this part of the exhibition? So, uh, here Paolo, we, right? Yes. Paolo. Oh, <laughs> so here we centered um, the importance of Catholicism here in Portugal. Um, so we have two secrets associated, the secret of Dali and the secret of the Atkinson Chapel. So to start off, uh, maybe with the chapel because it's a little quicker and sure. then we can enjoy the, the artwork. Sure. So, José de Souza e Azevedo was the first... Uh, Say the name again. José de Souza e Azevedo. Okay. He was the, the owner of Solar de Chopil, which was the, this land. And he, he made his fortune with uh, the commercial routes of wine. And so he had this chapel um, built to showcase the financial power because we have the cathedral right in front and then Santa Marina church right here as well. So it wasn't out of necessity, but really to showcase a status. Uh, furthermore, he even hired Nicolò Nazzoni, 
to intervene on the chapel, and this is the only authenticated work that we have uh, by him here in Gaia. All of the he others are in Porto. A Portuguese architect. He was an architect. Yeah. Yes. He intervened okay. a lot in Porto and in Gaia. Okay. And so he would have a restoration, and we we discovered the paintings by him. And now the restoration is done. It's a conservation process, so it leaves us the challenge of, in a digital world, where are we going to live for future generations to enjoy and to look after? Because these were real masters as well in their fields, and it's you can render one of these probably in the computer, but it's in your screen. It's not built right. like this. Yes. So. Every um, every every chapel, every church I've gone into, I'm just you know these palaces. I'm just completely done in by the mastery. Oh my goodness, look at this! Wow, of the painting and the building. Wow. Oh yes. So this is the original. Yes. 1760 part. Yes. And you can see the nativity here as well. So if you see here. We have a darker skin tone, so we belong to uh, one of the three wise men. Oh, okay. Oh, this is amazing. I love seeing this natural. So many of the, you know, some place, so many places I've gone into, they've been restored. And you know, it's nice. You know, restoration is nice, but but seeing um, seeing the age, I think, yeah, is beautiful. The authenticity of the, the art. Yeah, I think seeing the age is beautiful. It's a reminder that that art is not here forever. Right. So it's a, it's really a blessing to be able to experience this in our times from seventy sixty. Yes. So. And the is altar. this the original altar? No, the altar is poster. So the original, we guess, it came uh, to, the, to the marks, uh -huh. and then this was added afterwards. And that's all wood? Um, yes. Wow. It, it, you know, I, I've said this in my videos so many times, but looking at all these, um, I mean, this isn't the oldest thing in the world, you know, but but still, now, 1760s, I'm sure they had machinery by then that could help build this. Yeah, but it was still a, bit, a huge risk because, like, nowadays they didn't have health insurance, they didn't have labor laws like we have nowadays, so they still had to climb up some... Oh, banks. scaffolding and everything, right, yeah, I'm sure it wasn't, it wasn't easy to build, but um, I think probably you know, 1700s, they still had a little more, um, uh, a little more help from scaffolding machinery tools and everything than, say, the ones that were built, you know, in the, in the 1400s, you know? That was a challenge, sure. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, when I came in, you know, downstairs and went to the, uh, what I thought was the ticket spot, you know, it said, that whole very modern, you know, it said Atkinson 1760, and I'm like, this is not a 1760 building. <laughs> it was uh, up, let's say, um, because we have the investment of Flatgate Partnership, mm -hmm. and they own the, the group, so Yateman, Taylors, Fonseca, and Wow, and Atkinson are they, owned by them. Okay, so, so all those wineries and wine places and this it's are owned by who? By Flat, the Flatgate Partnership. Okay. And so they are... Um, they have been making a, a huge investment in this area and in museology here in Porto, in Gaia specifically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they created, created this beautiful um, gathering of museums and experiences. Yeah. And we call it the cultural district. Yes. And I think it makes uh, sense uh, given what we can present to, yeah. to our visitors. Absolutely. Now, when I, um, I sat outside and started the video, I said that, you know, I'm in Porto, but I'm across the river. So is Gaia still Porto? or so Gaia is a city. Porto is also another city. But oh. then Porto is also a district, oh. which includes uh, Gaia. So I wasn't entirely wrong. No. 
Okay. <laughs> um, but then it's it's funny because we have um, Caio de Gaia and Ribeira, so the two uh, parts down by the river. Uh -huh. And in Porto, there's also a place called Mira Gaia. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if you know the history of that. No. Um, so uh, the king, one of the one of the many kings that we had, <laughs> he had a wife, and his wife ran off um, to be with the the man she loved, and he got her. And to punish her, um, he took her there and said she was named Gaia. And uh -huh. so she's, he said, Mira Gaia, so Luke Gaia, uh -huh. because it, uh, this is the last view that you're going to have. And then he tied some rocks and threw her into the, the river. How lovely. Uh, <laughs> lovely story. I mean, kings <laughs> right, kings, so yeah. Wicked stories uh, and super inhumane yes. stories. Um, but that place ended up being. If you if you are there, you can really see the magnificence of Gaia. As it's still a, a beautiful sight. Uh -huh. in spite of sure, of course, this, yes, this yes, yeah, yeah. So, well, I think a lot of places in Europe and around the world were probably founded that way and have many stories. Yeah, the unfortunately, same. <laughs> but nowadays, thankfully, we don't have that part associated with that. It's just a beautiful view, mm -hmm. and most people also don't know the the stories, right, yeah. so that helps cover up. <laughs> A little bit of the not so pleasant side. Right. Uh, yeah. It is place. incredibly beautiful. Yeah. I my, when I first got here, I went. <sighs> <laughs> Did you go already? For instance, Jardin du Morro, the garden up here. I have not gone anywhere. This is actually. I got here on Wednesday afternoon, and um, I just you know came out and just walked around, and then yesterday I just had so much business to take care of, I couldn't do anything. So. No, I so I extended my my stay by a couple of days because oh, no. you know, no, yeah, I know, terrible. I gotta stay here a couple more days. Oh, it's awful. And it's sunny. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So last week was rainy. So oh, okay. We're yeah. Good luck. But Jardin du Morro is a place that people usually gather to watch the sunset. Oh, okay. And you can have the full bridge, uh, the full view of the bridges and the, the downtown of Porto as well. So it's beautiful. And you also have in the other side Virtudes. Uh, you have the garden and the street where also um, uh, people from the art field gather. So circus artists sometimes, uh, music um, dancers. So they just hang there. Oh, nice! And do their crafts until uh -huh. the, the sunsets. Wonderful! Sunsets. Great. I'm, I'm going to ask you to pin these two places yes, for course. me before yeah. I leave. So we've got some work in here. Yeah. Please go ahead. So here we approach the religious aspects. Um, him and uh, Gala, so a little of the backstory. Uh, Dali invited the Surrealists to a hangout in his place, and unfortunately for Paul Edouard, because he was a Surrealist poet, he uh, was accompanied by his wife, um, Gala Edouard. She was Russian, and she fell in love with Dali, and he fell in love with her, so she left his, uh, her husband, uh, Paul, ah. but they were married to the church, so they didn't get a divorce. And she married Dali in '58 through the, the the record, the civil record. Okay, so she never divorced the first husband, and she just had a civil wedding. Yes, with, with Dali. Dali. <gasps> and then after we call that polygamy in the U.S. <laughs> it's, their relationship was uh, very interesting and very avant-garde for what we expected. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more after. So, then Paul Edouard dies, and Gala and Dali get married in '58 um, through the church. She was already managing Paul's um, patrimonium mm -hmm. and Dali's and many other artists because she was really um, a woman of intellectual power and structure. Mm -hmm. um, so, she had a lot of. Um, capacities in that sense they had an open relationship by her demand he even offers her a palace um, and she's she agrees of course she's going to deny a palace <laughs> and she says but when you want to visit me you have to write me a letter because I might not want to put up with you or I might be with my lovers oh my and he's gosh. just like yes ma'am go girl she was the boss. so as wow. far as we know in terms of facts, uh, he never got involved with other people. Um, 
because to him it was a, an atrocity to even consider um, to connect with somebody else emotionally or sexually besides his wife. But he was okay with her doing it. Hmm? I mean, okay. Yeah, she was the big boss. She okay. was the brains of the operation. So. All right. He he was really not only in love. He became an obsession and an emotional dependence as well. We're going to see a little bit further. Okay. So, they get married through the church, but it wasn't really because he believed in God, but because he wanted to please her. Uh -huh. 59, 60, and 61, um, he starts painting um, Vision of Hell. He was commissioned by a soldier of the Blue Army. Um, and they were eating scargot, so the snails. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When now this was in Paris. When this, yes. Okay. Mm. So um, he ordered the the painting, um, and at first, like most of the the drawings, he put Gala in the center and started doing, you know, what we know of Dali in terms mm -hmm. of imagery. Mm -hmm. And then he was also writing his uh, letters to Sister Lucia here in Portugal, who had a site. And he decided to pay her a visit. So he came here to Portugal. Mm -hmm. That's why we centered that uh, religious part and aspect of Portugal here. And after speaking to her and understanding her view on what religion means to her and uh, what it opens up in her heart and mind, he starts to embrace um, religion, not entirely by heart, once again, but more because he thought he was not going to have a good uh, final ending mm -hmm. because of everything he had done so far. Mm -hmm. so he was, was definitely, I was saying, you heard me saying earlier what yeah. a creep he was, yeah. Yeah, he criticized and sexualized a lot of, uh, of religious motives. And so he was looking for an escape um, to the vision that he thought he was going to, uh, to have and as a final destiny. So he turns to church and he starts pouring his soul into the painting. So that was the trigger um, to create Vision of Heaven. Wow. Hmm. Before we get into details, just to let you know, we call it the secret conversion, mm -hmm. because uh, since it's so, I uh, say a lot, wickedly beautiful, mm -hmm. um, and the church didn't like his vision and approach, so it stayed hidden under Nan's bed for 20 years before it came out to the public. It, came, it, became, it was hidden where? Under a nun's bed. Under a nun's bed, yeah, So wow. she didn't sleep really well. <laughs> right. <I bet>. right. <laughs> but uh, then it surfaced, so we are talking 60, uh, 59, 60, 61, the production of the work. Uh -huh. So 20 years after would be in his final years, because yeah, uh, he dies in 89, so pretty much the final decade of his life. That's when it surfaced? Yes. Uh -oh. So, uh, very important here, we have the Scargo forks here uh -huh. um, that they used to, to meet, that center a total soul. Mm -hmm. um, also, because he felt like it was a torture for him to have to embrace the religion that he criticized so much, so we can associate that. And the uh, tearing eye mm -hmm. um, to his pain as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. We also have the, the satellites referring to the communism and war. Let me just make it like this. It's easier. See if it's, it's yeah, maybe the other, can you do the other one too? Oh. Yes, there we go. Yeah, well, if you can close the whole thing then. Yeah. Well, let's see. Yeah, we still need light though. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. That's okay. Still reflection, but not as bad. So. Yeah, the, the satellite. Here we also have to see a figure blessing the the opening for hell. So here. There he is. Let's see if I can do it this way instead of. It's a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yes. Um, to try to amend what has been done, has been broken, per se. And here, for the first time, he illustrates his mother as the holy figure. Oh, wow. His mother died when he was 16. She was extremely devoted, and uh -huh. his father was an atheist. So he grew up between those two worlds, and he lost his mother when he was young, and then got sent to the academy. And his father married uh, Dali's aunt. 
So <laughs> the family context was already yeah. It came from kind of a creepy something. family. Yeah. Yeah, and he had a brother who died when he when he was one year old uh -huh. from the pneumonia, uh -huh. and nine months after Salvador Dali is born. So he came kind of like a replacement son uh -huh. in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he was raised to believe that he was uh, the salvation of his brother's memory and of uh, his family's name and art. No pressure and there. No pressure at all. <laughs> That's why in the first room I always recommend people to remember the phrase where he said he said uh, tells his ambitions, uh, where he says he wants to be a cook, then Napoleon. And in the end of his life, he just wants to be able to be himself, so free from all those shackles and expectations, because I think that's what everybody wants to just mm -hmm. be ourselves, mm -hmm. free from prejudice as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he was ever able to. Uh, he always lived up to something, mm -hmm. uh, some his father's expectation, gala expectation, surrealist expect expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. It was a, a hard path for him. For sure. Um, and here we also have a baby. Uh, I can show you after in the in the um, cell phone. Yeah, I would I would suggest perhaps that they put this piece over there or one that's not under glass over here. Is it in that dark area right there? So the baby yeah, is right here, see it. but I'll show you in the. Yeah. So this is the the top part of the head, uh -huh. it's inverted, so it can also represent the lost souls in hell, uh -huh. or his soul being condemned in hell as an excuse to why he is like the way he is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it's not his fault, uh, it was yeah. God who put him right. in that situation already. Yeah, I wonder what kind of a conversation he and God had when he got there. <laughs> Are these like is this um, uh, mm -hmm. pen and ink or pen or something? Um, he used a lot of um, I, th I don't know if the translation is right. I apologize. Um, China ink. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah pen and ink. Of, yeah. Yeah. This was uh, so he, he did the original drawing and then they made uh, cast out of that as well to uh. to create the sculptures and it's very important. Um, he also has in the pictures of Robert Deschamps, uh, the French photographer, um, a photo of a friend that went into the hangouts, and uh -huh. they do exactly this pose. I'm going to show you after. Oh, really? So that's his photograph. Okay, so um, uh, Paolo was just telling me that all the images in this room are ones that Dali took yeah, from Goya. Yeah. He, he appropriated them. And and made them his own. So he um, so he kind of vandalized Goya. <laughs> he was right. he I wouldn't homage. call it vandalizing. No, he paid homage, but also criticized him in, uh, at the same time. So Goya criticized society, um, whether in uh, in ideologies, not uh, the lack of recognition uh, towards artists as well, mm -hmm. towards women, and. Pretty much portraying society as poor and blind. This was Goya? Yes. Okay, and well, Salvador Dali was commenting on that. Yes, so okay. Goya had to, of course, because of the political uh, tension in the, in the time, uh, he had to uh, keep it a little uh, low, you know, a little mm -hmm. undertone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, Dali, after, um, pays homage to that and establishes a... Um, uh, comparison because he says the same thing that Goya criticized I can criticize right now mm -hmm. in my in day to day. Mm -hmm. Nothing changed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and but he also criticizes Goya because in a way by adding elements he also says that you could have gone a little further. Mm -hmm. um, of course we are talking about a certain place of privilege uh, in terms of society and uh, political right. because if he did this back in in Goya's time he would have been uh, persecuted right for sure oh yes so yeah we see the you don't mess with the master yeah. <laughs> we see the the lack of uh humbleness of, of Dali as well because he's like you could have done this but he's not in his shoes 
but he, but he felt developed. that he was better. Uh, it, you know, I mean, to take a master's work like that yes. and say, well, you know, you could have done this, you could have done that. Then, you know, you're kind of really saying I'm better than you, bud. The right? only person that he recognizes that was better than him is Gala. For him, Gala was even bigger than God, even bigger than any energy in this world. So, Dang, I want to be a lady like that. <laughs> it, it was a little... Of, uh, too much obsession. Oh sometimes. yeah, I'm I mean, sure. That's why she needed a castle to, you know, <laughs> to calm to him down and keep little, him away. <laughs> her other lovers. Yeah. <laughs> wow, how much power can with? Wow, <laughs> I'd love to have met that woman and know what was so amazing about her to command that really kind of dedication. Poised. She really had a. You can see in the photos after. She really had something that just draws you into her and she's very careful with how she presents herself and her looks even just casually hanging out she's always wearing something mm -hmm. let's say not worthy but that would be worthy in the eyes of dali in the case to Re represent her as a goddess so she also very knew refined how to, to play the game. Yes, yeah. Definitely. Very good. Well, there's a lot here to look at. I'm gonna I'm gonna go off. I'm, I think I just I did kind of show this room. How many pieces are in here? Here I believe we have sixty uh, in this wall, but there are more. So we just couldn't <laughs> fit everything. So basically this is a short film for uh, that Salvador Dali and Walt Disney did. They started doing this project in nineteen forty five but it didn't fall through because of World War II and the Cold War and all of that. And so it was found by Walt Disney's nephew a lot of years after they both died. So Dolly died, Walt Disney died, and his nephew found their drawings and sketches and decided to make it happen. So it did happen and premiered in 2003. And it's basically a movie about a love story, but a doomed love story between the human Dahlia and Kronos, which is time. So, and in here, you can see in the movie, you can see a lot of Dali's futures when it, that he shows in his paintings, like clocks, like ants, bread, everything that he uses in his paintings, he transferred to the movie. And you're gonna see all of that, and it's a really beautiful movie and a really beautiful story, even though it's a doomed love story, so. Yeah, it's, um... It is pretty dark. It is really like just in its t in, in its tone. Yes. Oh my! Look at that. Yeah. That's a love story. There's his mustache over there, on the face. Of course. And it's called Destiny. So Destiny. Yeah. Destino. It's wild. Yeah. It's amazing that that Disney collaborated with him on a piece like this because. You know, I mean, Disney's whole reputation is, you know, happy, light. Yeah, but they, but, but Disney has this dark side, I think. Even with princesses, sometimes the stories take a lot of turns and some dark turns. True, I was, just, I was, thinking, of, I was thinking of that uh, right after I said it. Yeah. Because, you know, you had Mulan and, yes. um, you know, every other princess, yeah. Snow White. No, why it's yeah, <laughs> Cinderella. definitely a little dark. <laughs> yeah, so it's gonna start. So okay, so now it's gonna start again. Yeah, I don't need to record the whole thing. Okay. I'm just trying to give my my audience a taste of, of what's out there yeah. um, in my travels as far as art and everything. Yeah. So I'll just let I'll let everybody see the beginning a little bit. There we go, Salvador Dali. And Walter E. Disney. Mm. And I might have my information incorrect, but isn't the fact that they did this in color kind of special for 1945? Uh, I believe so, yes. I'm not sure as well because we don't talk about that here but I think so yes yeah because I think like the Wizard of Oz was like was 1939 yeah maybe, maybe a little later I, can't, I don't know but yeah it, it, it's um, amazing that this was 
Yeah, so early. Wow. But I mean, it did premiere on 2003, so it makes sense that it came out with color. Yeah, I was going to say, they might have colorized it. Yeah. It, it might have been done in black and white, but yeah. they might have colorized it. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's probably that. Okay, I'm going to go off. Hope everybody enjoyed that. What do we call it? What, what room is this? It's uh, through the Charles lens, which means that this is a photography room. So basically, Dali met Robert de Charme in 1950 and they become fast friends. They met on a boat, they become fast friends and de Charme was a photographer and Dali really liked his work. So he allowed de Charme to take a lot of pictures of him in his process of working and also in his day-to-day -day life. So it's a lot of int uh, intimate pictures that they take together and they make this beautiful work. There's thousands and thousands of pictures and here we just showcase some but all of them are new to the public and you can see a lot of different sites of Dali like it's a lot of different things I'm just gonna go along here yeah. for my people see. to see oh. Well, and I wonder, like, I'm sure, you know, he, he had such a, created such a persona around yeah. himself, too, so. There's a lot of pictures, like, you can see he's an eccentric in these pictures, but you can also see, like, him with Gala a lot, and their relationship, like, I love this picture, they look so in love. Like this one, too? Yeah. And oh, this yeah, one, and this one. so in love in that one, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I was saying to Paolo when he was telling me about how much power she had over him oh, and everything, I was like, I want to be her. Like, <laughs> okay, honestly. Yeah, what woman doesn't want somebody to give you a, a palace and say, okay, you can have whatever you want, even if it's other lovers, <laughs> but I still love you. <laughs> yeah, she would, and he would only go there if she allowed it. Like, yeah. He, he, did, he had to ask, he had to ask her, can I come in? And she would be like, oh, I don't feel like being putting up with you today. So Right? Yeah. <laughs> what a woman. And she was older than him. She was 10 years older. Than oh, him. well, that might have something to do with it though, then yeah. because his mother died young, right? When he was young? Uh, yes. So yeah, That's, that's funny. That's really funny. That's one. so funny. <laughs> are um, I, love, I also love this one. He has a huge umbrella. Oh my gosh. And this is the one I have in here. This one. The one I have in here uh -huh. because I love it. Yeah. yeah. So that might be why he was so um, fascinated by her. her. And yeah. also, I think, I think they say it was love at first sight. Like he saw her with Pauline Warren and he was like, this is the love of my life. But I also think it was the allure that she was 10 years older, a married woman. Like everything. Challenge. Exactly. Yeah. I think so too. We have more of the Shaman pictures here. This one with the nun. <laughs> he has so many funny pictures. We have a lot more in color here. Yeah. Well, he definitely liked to be provocative. He like, there's did. the famous one of him um, <clears throat> walking his, uh, his armadillo in yes. New York. <laughs> because he was afraid of ants, so it was the perfect animal to have. It was an anteater, right. Exactly. That is such an interesting tidbit. That is so funny. This is my favorite picture of him. Afraid of ants, that's hilarious. Yeah. Ah, uh, that one. Wow, so these are all photographs by the same guy. Yeah, by Robert de Charme. Look at that house, that's so cool. That's so cool. It was by Robert de Charme, he was French, and they were really good friends. Really, really good friends. I wonder who um, who got the ideas for these poses. Honestly, probably him. <laughs> probably Dali. I mean, he... Yeah, I would imagine so. His, his mind is just something else. Yeah, like I said, he probably didn't sleep very well. There. That's beautiful. They're so in love. Really? So in love? Well, like in here we have really an intimate side of him, I would say. Because in here he's a lot older. And... Then we have this picture. Oh wow. In which he's sick. You can oh, see man. that old age is taking yeah, him. Wow. And he's just Do you know who he's talking to? Who, yeah, who it says it here. Her? It says here. So uh no, it's this one. Salvador Dali, Robert de Charme, and mathematician Renaton, author of the theory of catastrophes. 
science freedom camp. So he's basically talking with Robert de Charles, which was a uh, the photographer. Was yes, and the yeah. mathematician. But he was really old here, you could tell. Yeah. But again, Dala, in this Dala died way. in... Usually with a love story like that, yeah. uh, a lot of times the man will go right after, but I'm just going to repeat what you said that... Um, yeah, so that basically, Gala died in 1982 and Dali died in 1989, but when she died, he tried to take his life because she was his whole world, she was his whole life. So he tried to take his life, he didn't make it, thank God, but his health started deteriorating and he went to live at her castle. I would say to be closer to her and for a person who lives for another person to be alive for seven years it's a lot of time torture so i think his last years were kind of torturous and depressing but well he powered through and then where did where did he live when she was living in a castle in the castle uh he lived he, i believe he lived in pont Liga in their house so this <laughs> pictures here it's the making of this art piece it's funny he picked up an octopus yeah. put it on paint and just oh he put the <gasps> the ox the octopus yeah, in the paint he's this. dipping I, I got it. yeah he's dipping the octopus in okay. paint and then putting it and then he did this <laughs> oh my gosh that's so hilarious exactly I bet the octopus didn't think so, but... I mean, I, I, I like to believe the octopus was already dead. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> so, and in here we have the crucifixion room. Oh, I would have missed this for sure. Yeah, because it's, it's a secluded room. Oh. Um, so, Paulo told you about his secret conversion. Yes. So, basically, this came after that. And this piece of art is fantastic. I don't know if you can see here. There is... Jesus Christ's chest. So there is his chest. You can see yes. a wound here. And then you can see a, a bird here, which yes. is a dove for life and resurrection and uh -huh. all that. And then there's. There we go. I can see a yeah, better now. Then you have all this dark, which is supposedly a, a sight, like a, a view. But the main focus here is Jesus Christ's chest, like yes. in the background, mm -hmm. being hurt, being crucified, and then the dove, which means the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous piece. And that was done in 65. Wow, yeah. it is a gorgeous piece. Yes, I think so. And it really shows that he converted. He converted to Christianism because he was scared that he was going to live in hell. <laughs> And then in here we have his cane. Oh, wow. <laughs> and his cane, the top, is... So it's based on the Fabergé eggs because Dalo was Russian. Ah. So he wanted to have that piece as well. And here we have a collection of pictures of him with canes. and with Different canes. This one and this one, you can see this cane specifically. That's so really that's pretty. Pretty. that's really pretty. Yeah, <laughs> and I see that you can see the cane in there. I have to go this way because the lights cause yeah. a lot of glare because of the the glass in front of the. Yeah. And then in here we have a picture of him with this mold, which is here, and this mold he did for um, airline for Air India, and it's called. The, uh, it's an ashtray, but it's called elephant and swan because it's a swan, but if you come from here, upside down, it looks like an elephant. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's interesting how much commercial work he did. He did a lot of commercial work. And you have here this underlining here. It, it was used that bracelet, this bracelet ah. here, to make this underlining. But he did do a lot of commercial work. I mean, he was eight years in America during World War II. So he started gaining a lot of money with commercial work, with art pieces and with things to do for, with fashion. And so they started calling him Avida Dollars, yes. which is an acronym for Salvador Dali and crazy for dollars. Right, yeah. Uh, Breton uh, named him that, right? Yeah, Breton named him that. Breton didn't like him very much at the time, but 
who doesn't want money? Well, there might have been a bit of jealousy too. Yeah, I think you so know, too, because that's... he got really famous and everyone wanted to work with him. Yes. And this here is a picture that he painted above and it's the ceiling of Dallas Castle. Of Gala's Castle. Nice. Gorgeous. I bet. <laughs> and here we have some paintings of him, different paintings. It's on paper, right? Yeah, and it's in titles. Then here, those are covered, covers he did for books. Yeah, I bet most people don't know that he was so much a commercial artist he in the was, beginning. Because everyone, yeah, exactly, everyone knows his most famous work, which is fantastic but he was he did a lot of commercial work for films books and magazines all of that well that's you know he probably did that stuff to get his name around exactly you he know work yeah perfectly and then you know he kept getting more and more work and then he you know was probably more free to do his own painting Thing. you know and this these three works are projects for house decoration and architectural projects well so in a way i mean I can kind of, I can almost see Breton's point um, yes. because he, did. he he got carried away with the money and all that. that would well, he so would basically do whatever. Yes. Yeah. He you would know. do everything and everything, anything and everything. I think he did things that he liked and he did things that made him money. Right. And he worked with, with that well, balance. And it worked for him. And that's what most artists have to do exactly. to, you know, anyway, really to make, if, if they want to make a living with art, exactly. you know, but now, you, you know, you used to, I mean, even like back in the Renaissance, you know, yes. those, those people were funded by the rich people and they made what the rich people wanted. I mean, that's exactly. just, that's the name they of the had game, to right? make what rich people wanted to make what they wanted. So, and to share the work. So it, it's really the name of the game. Yes, yeah. Well, I've been an artist all my life, and I've I've done I've done many commercial things too to be able to do what I, I think do. It's a tough it's a tough route to take, and you really gotta enjoy and love what you do. And an but you know it shouldn't be a tough it thing, you know, be. because without art, the world is just just devoid of soul, right? But I think I mean I'm an historian. I love everything history. Uh -huh. and it's really hard for us as well. Like, sure in this country but everywhere I think it's not something that it's valued art history art history everything it's archaeology I don't know it's people would rather go watch a football game and not have to think about anything I guess <laughs> which I get I totally get that's good to have mind-numbing things but sure it's yeah it's also very sad for us who our passion is these types of things well so you well you'll be happy to know you know uh, I thank you for doing this with me for my YouTube channel and um, I'm just you know I'm just starting to grow it but you'll be able to know that the people that follow me are art lovers and history love lovers you I know love and that that's why they'll be watching that's our crowd that's our little crowd Th right that's our tribe <laughs> tell me your name again uh, Nicole Nicole okay yes. <laughs> thank you so much thank you <laughs> it was a joy to have you here thank you whoa was that incredible or what. Uh, there's some really interesting work in there and boy, I, I learned an awful lot about Dali. I don't know about you and um, Shout out to Nicole Cargo my sorry Shout out to Nicole and Paolo for uh, giving us that wonderful tour They're so proud of their museum and so proud of their their city and their country. It, it's just really inspiring um, I think I was making a comment about uh, the, the show that I saw at the Philadelphia Art Museum uh, years ago, and I don't think I ever um, was finished saying what, what I was bothered about. So I, um, I think I was, I was talking about, it, you know, the drawing that Dali had that involved children. And I, what I was angry about was uh, not so much that they showed the, the piece, because, you know, if that's who he was, that's who he was, and, you know, whatever. Um, but uh, the curator, the curator chose to um, put the the drawing at eye level for children, where children could see it, and that infuriated me because you know there were two hundred pieces in it. He could have, you know, they could have hung it anywhere. But the fact that they they hung it low where it was um, visible to children really bothered me. But I get my panties in a bunch about a lot of things sometimes. But so. <laughs> But beyond that, um, wow, uh, this was, <laughs> I keep saying wow, and you know what, uh, this area is called wow, <laughs> the best cultural district, <laughs> district, 
Uh, it's called the World of Wine uh, because there are several museums clustered in this in this one area. Several wine cellars. So you can see uh, I'm on a, a busy kind of road, also. So. Um, yeah, but it's a cluster of museums, restaurants, um, uh, wine tasting rooms, etc. And it's uh, it's quite amazing. Sorry, I just got a low power thing. I'm gonna have to edit this. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. The, um, Nicole and Paolo were just amazing. We saw some really incredible stuff. Did not know about Dolly's. Um, link to to goya and the things that he did to to goya's uh lithographs and um wow the, the crazy crazy fascination obsession with with gala wow yeah i mean well you know dolly was he was he was obviously a nut but anyway i hope you enjoyed it please remember to subscribe like this video send it to your friends, help me grow my channel, okay? I'm trying to bring art of the world to the world as I travel around. Okay, bye.